So we need to address the difference between a low pressure and a high pressure chiller. And this is something you're really gonna run into with a centrifugal specifically. This is where the technology is used. So you're gonna be familiar with high pressure refrigerants and machines. Now, technically on a super specific level, the high pressure refrigerants, I believe are considered more actual like medium pressure on a refrigerant scale so we're not dealing with the thousands of psi's so i think if i understand right on a standard scale is considered medium pressure but from a chiller perspective we have high pressure and low pressure that is the designation that will separate these these will this will be how it's referred to in in the manufacturer's literature by low pressure uh because some let's give some examples some high pressures 134a 513 that's the new one coming out that's going to be replacing 134 uh 410a and r22 these were high pressure refrigerants all of them and basically the short story is they operate above a vacuum so they do not go below uh zero psi for their normal operating conditions they stay above that that's just a very rudimentary this is what we qualify as a high pressure machine and to give you some pressure examples so like 134 has a uh, 45 degrees so all of these will be 45 degree evaporators uh, saturation is 40 psi uh, this gauge all these will be gauge uh, 45 psi g for 513 410a is 130 psi g and r22 is 76 psi g where with our low pressure refrigerants so we're getting into the oldest or not the yeah one of the older ones of them is r11 which operates at a negative 6.8 psi g yes negative so it's in a vacuum uh, 123, which was a negative 8.2 PSIG. This is at 45 degrees of saturation on the evaporator. Uh, 514, which was, well, that's the new one. So there's two new ones on this negative, on the low pressure side. 514 is one of them. Uh, technically, 123 replaced R11. And then now 123 is being phased out by 514. And the next one. Uh, so 514 at 45 degrees is negative 8.5 psig and 1233zd 1233zd technically there's an e in there but anyway to summarize uh, is negative 5.2 psig at 45 degrees with well, these low pressures they are operating below uh, zero psig and even the condenser side so if you're running fairly warm condenser water or if you get a fairly significant load you can push these condensers into a few psig and it'd be perfectly normal uh, but it's also normal that they'll float right at that zero psig to maybe one psig in order to just hit whatever saturation temperature they needed that's going to be heavily dependent upon the load and the entering water coming into the chiller so these two chillers behind me, the train on my on the right, that is a, uh, a low pressure chiller. These originally ran R11, then they transitioned to uh, 123, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think train is switching to 514. That is the refrigerant they committed to. Uh, I think on some of their other lines, I could be mistaken here, but I think on some of their newer lines like the Agility Mag Bearing, I think they went with the 1233. I think I'd have to look that back up to, to verify that but train was one of the early ones who was in the conversation of switching to one of these you know one or 1233 there's actually another one it was one two three four yf or something like that that was actually one of the earliest ones that was that train had rumored to be moving towards and as far as i'm aware that didn't happen and this yk on the left side this is a high pressure these were these run 134a uh so just to show you the the difference in the machines and which ones could be which so there are some design requirements that separate low pressure from, from high pressure uh there's more safety 
steps involved with a high pressure because well it is a high pressure uh so like the pressure reliefs and the sealing material that has to be used these things are put under more stress being a high pressure application and the, the pressure reliefs are like they've got extremely specific venting rules granted it's not that the low pressure doesn't but low pressures typically don't have traditional pressure reliefs they'll have what's called a rupture disc and typically it's located on the suction end bell coming off of that and it's literally a a disc typically they'll rupture at about 15 psig for most applications uh, and it's just a big open port that essentially if the machine was allowed to get to that kind of pressure it'll it'll blow out uh, i've had well for young chiller technicians it is very common to accidentally over pressurize when your senior wasn't necessarily looking uh, i've had many apprentices do this and then they end up blowing the rupture seal out because they accidentally pumped it to you know 20 something psi and then they wonder why it won't hold pressure well how much did you pressurize it to oh we had about 20 20 okay we, we need a new rupture so which is about 500 to a thousand dollars depending on the machine so uh yeah rupture seals are a rupture disc are the um the pressure relief for most of your low pressures so yeah the sealing itself is a little bit different uh, and, and how we go about using that. Also, the impellers can change a bit. So how we design the impeller and how the impeller gets used changes because the low pressure refrigerant molecules, and I guess this is technically true between any refrigerant, just the refrigerant molecules themselves are very different. And because of that, they have different requirements as to what the impeller needs to be designed for in terms of size and speed in order to achieve the same volume and lift that is required that'll be one of the differences that you'll see kind of fairly consistent but overall it, it doesn't change what an impeller is an impeller is still an impeller still has the same fundamental characteristics and we'll talk about impellers in this module. My point is just to notate that there are some design characteristics that will change between them. Now, one of the things that low pressures have that high pressures don't need is a purge system. So because it's low pressure and it operates in a vacuum, it's got a lot of risk to pull in non-condensables. So that's actually just kind of a known Thing in this industry that we just we deal with is why we have purge systems it is really important to mitigate and manage that purge system needing to function at all than anything else uh, this is part of what's going to make low pressure machines a little more challenging is because with high pressure you know we typically unless there was just an egregious error dealing with non-condensables isn't that big of an issue but when you get into low pressure having to address non-condensable problems is a big issue and it's something we deal with a lot and having purge systems that aren't functioning and causing surging conditions is something we deal with a lot the whole point of the purge is to remove atmosphere and we'll also have a whole lesson dedicated just to talk about purge systems but we're trying to get that atmosphere or the non-condensables specifically back out of the refrigerant, out of the condenser, so that we can try to maintain as smooth an operation as we can. That way, even if we get some very minor leaks that, say, aren't overly consequential to the chiller, we're able to address and deal with those leaks before they become major problems. And eventually, you know, that happens on a high pressure, uh, then we end up having to either have the whole charge cleaned, which is a, is a, a process. Um, typically you'll hire that out or, or you'll have a machine brought in that can cycle that refrigerant and remove those non-condensables and other things out of the refrigerant. Or you will, uh, you'll just end up having to replace the whole charge depending on the, the conditions and how severe it is. With low pressure, that purge unit handles all of that for us. That is its function and its job is to, to keep those non-condensables out of the system. I don't see very many people that teach this. And now social media, we've got some really good 
guys out there that are uh, teaching proper and strong practices. But I, I find that even a lot of instructors I've worked with over the years, not all, not all, not, not, a lot of, not the ones I came up with, but a lot of instructors don't put enough emphasis on saturation troubleshooting, which is temperature troubleshooting versus pressures and trying to learn, okay, this refrigerant operates at this pressure, this refrigerant operates at this pressure. And I'm really going to, if, if you haven't established this as a practice already, I'm going to press this now. You really need to start looking at refrigerant as whatever it's, temperatures are unless you're calibrating a valve that like a pressure regulating valve where pressure is a factor or you're trying to test a um a, a sensor transducer something like that to see if it's accurate so unless you're doing something that is pressure specific vast majority of everything else that you're going to need to do the saturation temperature is what actually matters and then the physical temperature not not whatever pressure is happening. So when you just, when you get into a conversation with a seasoned chiller technician, don't start talking pressures, okay? Unless you're talking about oil deferential or something like that, or deferential across the compressor, uh, or your lift, things along those lines. If you're talking about refrigerant, and you're trying to just have a discussion around what is happening on the refrigerant side, it is irrelevant what type of refrigerant you have what temperature do you have what is your saturations and then tell me what are your water temps and that's going to give me a lot to work with versus you try to communicate some kind of pressure i, I don't care about pressure all right i care about what are your temperatures and then we'll go off of there now one thing i do want to know i, I displayed everything here or i sorry i talked about everything here in a uh, gauge format it is very, very common with low pressure to talk in atmosphere. So be very mindful of that whenever you're going to either read the literature or you're going to uh, go through the panel. It may be PSIA. And even between literature to panel, everything in there is written in PSIG. But then you get to the chiller and the whole panel is displayed in PSIA. And you've got to be able to convert that in the field and understand how to interchange these pressures. One app I would highly recommend is Ref Tool by Danfoss. It is a fantastic app. I've used it for years and years, and they've only made it better over time. But that is this one here. So this is Ref Tool, an incredible system. Highly recommend and like you can go in and save all your favorite refrigerants if you're not familiar with this I've got that whole list. I just detailed out there inside of there like that I Can't promote that app enough. It is extremely useful and Especially if you're in that situation where you're trying to switch back and forth between PSIG and PSIA it is actually really easy to do that instead of trying to run conversions and stuff or do math in my head that I'm not very good at to begin with um, using that as a in-between measure helps a lot anyway low pressure high pressure really important to understand the fundamental differences um, most of what happens inside of the chiller doesn't change a whole lot okay uh, between the two styles so our overall compressor our overall, uh, you know, centrifugal theory, refrigerant theory, very little changes in between each type. It's about when we get into things that are specific that we need to just be more mindful of, such as the purge system, such as the physical pressures we operate at, and the leak searching. You know, there's a whole leak search process with low pressures that you don't need for high pressure because, well, we have to pressurize the machine and we have equipment to do that with. Uh, we'll talk about those things, but the nice part is the vast majority of what there is to share It's going to be interchangeable between low pressure high pressure. That, that was part of my main point there. Anyway, let's roll on with lessons